please stand for the gospel reading. Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. The Lord is a great God. O oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Harden not your hearts. Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over he was famished. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all their authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. But Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will lift you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. But Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. What does it mean to be saved? To be safe, to be delivered. In Deuteronomy, we see the Israelites, an alien people, a group of wanderers who were in need of deliverance. They were treated harshly. They were afflicted. They were forced to do hard labor. And so they cried out to the Lord, the God of their ancestors. And what happened? The Lord heard their cry, and he saw their affliction, and he answered their prayer. He displayed his mighty power and he used signs and wonders and he brought them out of their place of oppression. No longer would they have to toil in misery again. And not only that, he brought them into a place of deliverance, of inheritance, of enough food to eat and land of their own to live in, into a life of blessing and abundant provision. This is great, great news. Deliverance has come. They are safe. The end. <laughs> well, but wait. There are many people like the Israelites in the world today. They continue to be afflicted, like the Rohingya at the hands of the Burmese military. They continue to be forced to do hard labor, like the fishermen trapped in boats in the Gulf of Thailand. And they continue to be treated harshly, like women, minorities, and other people who are marginalized in society. What happens when they cry out? Does the Lord hear their cry? Does the Lord see their affliction? Does he answer their prayer? Doesn't always seem that he does. So what do these promises to Israel mean for any of us today? Maybe the problem is that the people I've mentioned don't know God. After all, in Deuteronomy, it says that they cried out to the God of their ancestors. In Psalm 91, we, might, we see how that might matter. Maybe salvation and deliverance are only for the few. Psalm 91 offers a beautiful picture of wonderful promises that every person who has ever been oppressed longs for with their every breath and their very flesh. No evil shall befall you. No scores shall come near you. Angels shall guard you. You won't dash your foot against a stone, and you will trample dangerous animals under your feet. 
I will deliver. I will protect. I will answer. I will be with you in trouble. I will rescue you. I will satisfy you. I will show you my salvation. But each of those promises comes with a conditional clause. If you love me. If you know my name. If you call to me, abide in me, live in me. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. Good news for them, but what about the rest of us? Perhaps then we should ask, how can we meet those conditions so that we too can receive the promises? And this brings us to our next scripture. Romans 10 tells us how to find that salvation so we can find salvation. Romans provides its own list of promises. You will be saved. You will not be put to shame. You shall be saved. The great news is that this promise is open to all. Romans 10.13 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not just the descendants of Abraham but for Greeks as well as Jews. All are invited. All are welcome in. There's only one condition, and it's not based on who we are, but it's based on what we all can do. If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is great news indeed. But what does it mean to be saved? To be safe, to be delivered, to be blessed. Does it mean that every one of those promises in Psalm 91 is a lifetime guarantee? If you believe Jesus, you will never have anything go wrong. You'll always be delivered, protected, rescued, satisfied. God will answer your every prayer, and you'll always feel his presence. <laughs> that would sure be nice. But we know from our own experience that that's not always the case. People suffer, even people who follow God, even Jesus himself. In Luke 4, we read how Jesus was tempted by the devil. What does it mean to be tempted? Was it a pleasant experience? Probably not. It took place for 40 whole days. What have you given up these 40 days of Lent? What day are we on? 40 days is a long, long time. And Jesus was famished. He ate nothing at all. Nothing. Jesus was fully God and fully human. My guess is that that fully human part was gnawing away at his stomach by then. How do you feel when you're hangry? I mean, hungry. Jesus is not looking very safe in that moment, or very protected, or cared for, or satisfied. But surely Jesus, God cares for Jesus as much as he cared for the Israelites or the psalmist. Surely if he wanted to deliver Jesus from temptation, he could, but he does not. Surely he could deliver the Rohingya from their misery, or us from ours, but once again, he does not. So what does that mean? Does it mean that God's promises are not true? Does it mean that he's not able or not good? Is salvation only some ephemeral panacea to distract the masses from an inescapable hell on earth? If so, what kind of salvation is that? There's a great movie called The Prince's Bride. And in it, a character, character keeps repeating the word inconceivable at the most inappropriate times. Finally, another character says to him, I do not think that word means what you think it means. Perhaps we need to ask ourselves this morning, what do we think it means to be saved? Does it really mean what we think it means? For many of us, we think that the word saved means the same as the word safe. 
that no trouble will ever befall us, like in Psalm 91. But is that what it really means? Did you notice that in the Gospel reading, the devil used the very promises that were given for our comfort in Psalm 91 to tempt Jesus? How is it possible that these beautiful promises, angels shall protect you, they will bear you up and you won't dash your foot against a stone? How can those beautiful promises suddenly be the substance of the greatest temptation? Perhaps saved doesn't really mean what we think it means. Perhaps it's more than just being safe from harm. Perhaps there's something deeper going on. In offering these promises to Jesus, the devil was making his own set of conditional statements. If you take care of yourself and turn the stone into bread, then you'll be satisfied. If you worship me, then you'll have kingdoms and land as your inheritance. If you do something dangerous, then you won't be harmed. No matter what, you'll always be safe. You'll always be free. Of course, all of these results, satisfaction, land, safety from harm, are things from the Deuteronomy passage that God gave to the Israelites when he delivered them from the Egyptians. So what's wrong with any of these things? Isn't that what God promised us anyway? Hasn't he been a little slow in delivering? What's wrong with taking care of ourselves? Doesn't the Bible say God helps those who help themselves? It doesn't, by the way. <laughs> the point of this story is subtle, yet profound. The devil distorts the promises that God, sorry, the devil distorts the very promises of God to distract Jesus from God's true purpose. He uses the lure of God's promise of salvation to lull us into a false sense of safety. He twists the promises of God's protection to sell us a counterfeit blessing. I don't think that word means what you think it means. Perhaps what we are truly misunderstanding is the nature of God's promise, the nature of God himself. We focus solely on the result then you will be safe, secure, fed, protected. And we forget about the conditions, available to all, but conditional nonetheless. If you love me, know me, call to me. In fact, when I first saw this dynamic in Psalm 91, my mind skipped over it because it didn't make any sense. God's conditional promise is a bit circular. How so? Let's look again at Psalm 91, 1 and 2. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge shall come to your tent. In other words, those who live in God's shelter will say, God is my shelter. Those who have made God their refuge will say, God is my refuge. Duh. Huh? <laughs> what? Perhaps saved doesn't mean safe at all. Perhaps it means so much more. The point is not receiving the shelter or the refuge point is the one in whom we tr put our trust to provide it. The point is not that God's promise to protect us fails. It's that we forget that it's God and not ourselves who is the one who protects us in the first place. The point is not that we won't have earthly troubles, but that no matter how evil or excruciating they are, they don't last forever. And that the true deliverance we need is not from temporal harms, but from eternal ones. The point is not that God is a wand to wave to make all the bad go away, but that he is all good, and a harbor in which we can dwell securely, regardless of how strong the storm is that rails against us. 
So let's ask ourselves today, are we mistaking the shelter for the Savior? Are we trading salvation for safety? Are we settling for mere comfort instead of true deliverance? What does it mean to be saved? To be safe, to be delivered. Let us ensure that we experience God's meaning and not our own, today and every day.